Good evening, everyone, and welcome to, the, to tonight's presentation entitled Religious Hybridity and Christian Identity. And it's my pleasure and privilege to get to introduce our speaker, uh, Professor Catherine Cornell. Dr. Cornell is the Newton College Alumni Chair of Western Culture and Professor of Comparative Theology here at Boston College. She obtained her PhD from the Catholic University of Leuven, Belgium, where she also taught for 10 years. She has been teaching full-time at Boston College since 2005, so she must have started when she was a teenager, uh, and was chair of the theology department from 2010 till 2016, so she has also paid for her sins, right? <laughs> um, no, actually, it's a very, it's a wonderful, there's wonderful colleagues in the department, I shouldn't have said that. Her teaching and research focus on theoretical questions in theology of religions, comparative theology, and interreligious dialogue. Dr. Cornell has authored or edited 16 books in the area of interreligious dialogue. I'm not going to name all of them, but some of her uh, prominent titles include The Impossibility of Interreligious Dialogue, published in 2008, Interreligious Hermeneutics in 2010. Interreligious Dialogue and Cultural Change, 2012, The Wiley Blackwell Companion, Companion to Interreligious Dialogue, 2013, Women and Interreligious Dialogue, 2013. I think you're picking up on a theme, right? Uh, Christianity Between Secularity and Plurality, 2015, and finally, Meaning and Method in Comparative Theology, published this year. She's also the founding editor-in-chief of the book series, Christian Commentaries on Non-Christian Sacred Texts. An accomplished teacher and prolific scholar, a great friend to uh, the STM's continuing ed program, and I also add to the uh, uh, Boston College uh, EF uh, board, uh, on which she served for a number of years. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to Dr. and Catherine Cornell. Thank you very much, Tom, and thank you all for coming out on this first uh, fall day or evening. Um, it's a great pleasure to be with you tonight and to um, speak about a topic that has really been of interest to me for a very long time. Uh, one of the um, first books that was published on the topic of multiple religious belonging, I think, is a volume that I edited in 2002 called Many Mansions, Multiple Religious Belonging, and Christian Identity. It's a volume that uh, I edited because I had just come from Europe and I had just um, organized a, topic, uh, a conference on the topic of multiple belonging in Europe and I realized that there was really nothing in the English speaking language on the topic. And so I pulled together some of the most interesting scholars who had something to say on the topic and, uh, and that gave birth to this volume which currently in all the publications on, on multiple religious belonging, religious hybridity, continues to be quoted quite a bit, so I'm quite uh, happy uh, and proud about that. Um, so that was 2002, and since then there's been a flood of publications, articles, and books on the topic of religious hybridity, multiple religious belonging, um, and I have a few show, for show and tell on the, uh, table in the back of the room, but just the latest one has the telling title, When One Religion Isn't Enough, uh, by uh, Duane Bidwell that was published uh, last year. So this is a topic that's become very um, important and prominent, I think, in uh, the area of interreligious dialogue and interreligious engagement and just theology in general because the phenomenon is becoming so widespread indeed as religious identities are shifting, uh, people are being exposed to all these different options of, of uh, religious beliefs and religious practice. It's all readily available right here around us. People can go to Buddhist centers, to Hindu centers, to Jewish centers, to Muslim centers. They can study these religions uh, in classes or online. So. It's not surprising that this is becoming a more widespread phenomenon as people are absorbing all of this information and making it their own to a certain extent. So what we see is really a kind of shift in, 
in religious identity as people are exposed to all these different uh, religions. And with this has also developed a whole new nomenclature about how to call this phenomenon. So I started calling it multiple religious belonging. Uh, actually, in my early work, I was quite critical about it. You will see that I have become more nuanced as time has gone on. Uh, but, you know, people call it multiple religious identification, multiple religious bonds, multiple religious participation, spiritual fluidity, uh, religious flexibility, and so forth. So there's a whole uh, set of names that are used to, uh, to refer to that phenomenon um, that uh, I think call also for, uh, for nuancing, and we'll go into that uh, in a minute. But what all of these phenomena have in, uh, have in common is a certain uh, focus on the individual as a source of religious truth and authority, and it, what I call a detraditioning. So people are moving away, or, or the bonds to religious traditions are loosening, and people are basing their religious identity on their own individual process of discernment. You know, so that's what all this phenomenon or all these different names of phenomena have in common. So individualization of religion and detraditioning. Um, what, what's necessary, I think, at this point in the development is to create some uh, differentiation between all of these uh, different phenomena that are uh, developing. Another, of course, name that is used is uh, spiritual but not religious. That's also a very common name. It has acquired the acronym SBNR, and people talk about SBNRs. Uh, so there are nuns and SBNRs and multiple belongers and so on. And so all of these categories tend to be uh, put in, in the same basket. What I would want to do first in this presentation is make some distinctions between all of these different types of, of religious uh, detraditioning and, and identification. Um, so this phenomenon may seem to be new, but for those of you who were alive in the 60s, most of us I think here, uh, we will remember also the New Age movement, and sometimes this whole phenomenon is, is, is considered as a kind of New Age gone mainstream. That's what some scholars have, uh, have uh, said about this phenomenon of, uh, of SBNR. And it can be, go even further back to the theosophical uh, tradition of the late 19th, uh, early 20th century. So it is new in its, in its uh, spread, I think, but it's not new as a phenomenon. When people are exposed to different religious traditions, it seems irresistible for them to make their, uh, their own combination of different uh, traditions. So first of all, I want to make a distinction here and, and make clear that what I am talking about tonight is religious hybrids, uh, meaning people who claim to belong to more than two, more than one religion. So dual belongers or multiple belongers. So people who still want to or claim to or aim to belong to two religious traditions. And that's different from the nuns or the SBNRs who, who don't care about belonging to any religious tradition anymore. I think it's important to make this distinction uh, to see how we can relate to that or evaluate that from uh, a Christian theological uh, perspective. So these people claim to uh, believe or aim to belong to two traditions and, and believe that it's possible to belong to uh, more than one religious tradition. So that's the phenomenon that I will be looking at uh, this evening. Within this phenomenon of religious hybridity or dual be belonging, I think we still can make all kinds of further differentiations. One that I make is between involuntary and voluntary dual belonging or multiple belonging. Um, so the phenomenon may be new in the West, but in Asia, people have belonged to multiple religious belonging, to multiple religious traditions since maybe in China since the ninth century, and in Japan probably since the sixth century. Uh, so people belong to different religions that have shaped 
the culture in particular ways. So in China, uh, Buddhism has become the religion of funerals. Taoism is the religion of life and, and spirituality. Confucianism is a religion that governs people's ethical life. So these different religions have taken on different functions in society and have contented themselves with just filling in particular needs in the lives of believers. So the Chinese belong to Chinese culture that is shaped by multiple religious traditions. So there it's not really a matter of choice it's a matter of involuntary belonging to these different religions because they happen to be Chinese. The same in, in Japanese culture where people are Shinto and Buddhist and maybe Christian also when they get married. And when they get sick, they maybe belong to a new religious tradition. So in those, tr in those contexts, they belong to the culture that is shaped by different religious traditions. So that's one form of involuntary dual belonging. Another form would be... Uh, when one is born in a family where mother is, is Christian and the father is Jewish, for example, or you know, a family where parents uh, adhere to different religious traditions and leave the child the flexibility or the option to come with them to the church and the synagogue and maybe decide for themselves at a certain point in their life. So this is another form of involuntary dual belonging where you, you belong to your family unit that is defined by two uh, different uh, religious traditions. Over against that then is the voluntary multiple belonging where people themselves choose to adhere to another religious tradition in, a, in, a, in addition to their primary uh, tradition. Within that category, you can make another distinction between uh, temporary and permanent double belonging. So, uh, those of you who are familiar with, uh, with India or many other cultures, in fact, when people ha are in uh, situations of despair or disease or any other human need, they may go to a particular temple or shrine where that need is addressed in a particularly successful way. So in India, for example, there are many Christian churches that Hindus also visit when they when they have particular needs that they believe that Jesus can address, you know, needs for health or needs for success or what have you. So people will always, you know, visit religious temples and shrines that they believe have particular miraculous powers and can address the need that they have at a particular moment. But what you see in that case of multiple identification or belonging is that the belonging only lasts as long as the problem is there. So usually when the problem is over, people go back to their primary belonging. Um, but the phenomenon we will be looking at tonight is people who claim to permanently belong to two religious traditions, permanently and voluntarily belong to two religious traditions. And there you can still make a distinction, I think, between what I call um, uh, uh, soft dual belonging and hard dual belonging, uh, or partial dual belonging and full dual belonging. So the soft or the partial dual belonging are people who still have a primary identity within a particular religion and who integrate elements from another religious tradition as it fits within their primary identification. So that would be the soft uh, dual identification. The hard dual identification or belonging would be people who have lost any primary identification. So they may go to one religion or, or identify with one religion and use that religion as normative in certain cases and use the other religion as normative in other cases, but go back and forth like, you know, standing between two religions without a, either one being dominant. Yeah, so that would be a hard dual belonging or um, uh, uh, full dual belonging. So uh, what I will talk about today are people who are between the partial or the soft and the hard dual belonging. And that takes various forms. So, you know, um, the most common form, I think, in the West is Christians who also identify as Buddhists. I think this is the most common 
type of dual belonging, but uh, there are many Jews who also identify as Buddhists, and there's even an acronym for that, Jubus. Uh, I have always wondered why there's no acronym for Christians who also identify with, with Buddhism, and that would be Kribu. <laughs> I think that it's obvious why that name hasn't stuck. Um, but there's, there are also, you know, um, there's mention sometimes of Krislam, so people who are Christian and Muslim at the same time. So you have all these different combinations of religions that uh, are taking place um, and that are uh, causing shift in uh, religious identity. So tonight I, I will focus mostly on uh, Christian Buddhist dual belonging because as I said, it's the most common one and I think the one that also um, from a Christian point of view is most interesting and calls for, uh, for some kind of reflection from a, from a Christian theological perspective. But much of what I say tonight I think would also be applicable to Christians who say they, are, they also identify with parts of Hinduism or uh, any of the Asian religions. Um, so uh, first, what is the appeal of, for, of these Asian religions and particularly Buddhism for Christians? Of course, this is a highly personal matter. And as I said before, that is the definition of uh, dual belongers, that they, uh, that they come to the question from a very individual and personal uh, perspective, but I think there are certain commonalities between Buddhist Christian dual belongers uh, that uh, that are not so hard to get a hold of. I think when you look at at the uh, tendency of Christians to uh, to uh, to also practice and believe in aspects of uh, of Buddhism. First, I th I think Buddhism offers a very clear. Um, recognizable analysis of the reality of suffering and dissatisfaction uh, that people experience in the Western consumerist materialist uh, context. So Buddhism is very, uh, very clear and very um, straightforward in its analysis of, of human suffering and dissatisfaction. And I think most Westerners uh, identify that with that very quickly. So the first noble truth is life is suffering, meaning life is basically dissatisfaction, and dissatisfaction is caused by selfish desires and by our ignorance. So this is very easy to access or to understand and even identify with, I think, from a Western consumerist uh, uh, materialist perspective. Secondly, I think Buddhism has developed a very sophisticated understanding of the human mind um, Buddhism is a religion that has focused uh, entirely on understanding how desire emerges in the mind and how to control the mind and how to control different desires. So for centuries, Buddhism started in the first, fifth century before the common era, for centuries Buddhism has focused all of its effort to understand how desire arises in the mind and how it can be controlled. So it has a very so sophisticated and subtle understanding of the human mind that I, I think also speaks to people uh, in a contemporary context. Thirdly, I think it has developed a very clear or very ready uh, uh, spiritual therapies that people can readily access without any need for uh, conversion or for uh, sophisticated philosophical and theological understanding, people are in need or searching for experience and for uh, um, a sense of wholeness and well-being that uh, Buddhist therapies can offer people and have, uh, and have developed many different types of therapies that people can practice depending on their personality and their inclination. So in Buddhism you have uh, you know, Zen Buddhism that is very uh, icono uh, iconoclastic where it's all about sort of sitting in meditation, staring at a white wall, or else you have Tibetan Buddhism with all of its iconography and its images. So 
very different types of therapies and techniques that people with different inclinations or different interests can easily access and, uh, and take advantage of. And so I think that's also one of the reasons why Buddhism in particular is so appealing. People are really searching for spiritual techniques and practices that have an immediate spiritual effect that they experience immediately. And Buddhism has that to offer, I think, by the way, Hinduism also and most religious traditions. But there's something about Buddhist practice that's very readily available and people turn to. And then finally, I think, as I said before, in order to practice Buddhism, there's no requirement for any faith in any transcendental reality or uh, personal god or gods. So the faith element in Buddhism is, I, don't, I won't say absent, but not quite as central as in many other religious traditions. So it's really a therapeutic, a spiritual, spiritually therapeutic tradition that people um, uh, have uh, identified with and have access to very readily. And all of these elements, I think, explain the popularity of Buddhism and certain forms of Hinduism, I think, also um, in the West. Now, how do people who practice Buddhism and Christianity, though, how do they bring those two traditions together? How do they make sense of the possibility of practicing those two religious traditions? There are various uh, ways in which scholars and practitioners have given legitimacy to this practice. And in the back, I have a few books um, that talk about belonging to Buddhism and Christianity and explain sort of the rationale that different people have for, uh, for this possibility. But in the first place, most of them will argue that there is really only one transcendent reality and that different religions are different reflections of that transcendent reality and that they all aim, come from, and aim towards the same uh, transcendent experience and goal. Yeah. So they're all oriented towards the one uh, ultimate reality. And so different religions can be combined because they're ultimately going to the same place. Yeah. So that's uh, an, an approach called monocentric pluralism. So they all go to the same central uh, goal. Uh, but they all have their different practices. Many scholars also emphasize that really Christianity and Buddhism have a significant amount of teachings in common. So both traditions emphasize the idea that the cause of suffering and evil is in our selfish uh, desires. So that that is really the origin of, of all uh, evil in the world that we identify with our selfish desires and, and uh, pursue those desires at the expense of what we're ultimately called to do and to be. So that's another commonality that, or one commonality that Buddhism and uh, Christianity have. Another would be that uh, delusion is the ultimate uh, cause of all um, selfish desires. So there's, there are cer certain ways of understanding evil in the world that are similar in Buddhism and, and in Christianity. Some scholars will argue that uh, really the idea of a creator god has a lot in common with the Buddhist idea of dependent origination. Uh, I can't really elaborate on that uh, right now because it would lead us too far, but often it's said that the, the idea of a personal creator god is in conflict with Buddhist teachings, but some scholars have found ways to reconcile the two and to say that they really have, uh, in the end, a lot in common. You know, the ultimate goal of salvation and liberation may be more similar also than, than they're often made out to be. That's another way of arguing for the similarity between the two traditions. So some scholars really emphasize the similarities between the two traditions, which make it possible to belong to both at the same time. Others go another track and say, well, the two religions are really complementary. Each religion emphasizes particular aspects of, of uh, human spiritual need and desire. So Christianity, for example, will be the religion of social justice and social change. And that's really what Christianity has become specialized in. 
whereas Buddhism is a religion of inner transformation. And so the two religions really need one another. Uh, the idea of inner transformation and reaching one's own personal enlightenment needs the Christian understanding of, of commitment to social change and, and liberation of the poor and so forth. Whereas the Christian understanding of liberation of the poor and social change needs the Buddhist idea of inner transformation or else our commitment to social change will always be tainted by our own selfish desires and so forth. So this is another way of, of saying, well, the two religions are really complementary. One you know, fits neatly into the other and they can both uh, be practiced uh, in a way that help one another uh, attain the ultimate, uh, the ultimate um, good in life. Still others will, uh, will focus on, uh, on the fact that loving Buddhism and loving Christianity is like loving two parents or loving two children. And when that's advanced as, as an argument, it's usually against my critique of multiple identification. When I have written about it, I've talked about religious belonging and, and used the spousal metaphor to talk about belonging as being a complete surrender and commitment to one particular religious path. Uh, and so I've used the, the analogy of, of commitment to a spouse. And so critics of my approach will say, no, multiple belonging is like loving two parents or loving two children. You can love them both equally and at the same time, and then there's no conflict between one another. To which I would respond that, uh, that, that children and parents don't expect that full surrender of oneself to, uh, to themselves, whereas a spouse does, uh, just like a religion does. So I, I don't know if the, if the analogy of, uh, of two children and two parents really works in this, uh, in this case. But you see that, that people who practice this are all looking for ways in which they can make sense of it and, uh, and uh, they can give it some theological uh, coherence. You know, many people who practice multiple belonging are not so interested in, in theological or lo logical coherence. It just works. You know, so if it works, it's true. Uh, and that's the way multiple belonging has often been uh, experienced, whether in Asia or, or uh, nowadays also in the West. And that's really uh, where um, many people uh, are. You know, and people do form their own private synthesis of how the two religions work for them and how they cohere in their own mind and they don't have to make sense of it and argue uh, you know, in, in, uh, in an in a official capacity that the two religions belong together. One of the characteristics, as I said, of religious hybridity is that people just make their own synthesis and their own uh, way of, of uh, understanding how they, the two religions cohere. So that's how, uh, how I think it's lived and, and rationalized and experienced. And now I want to uh, go a little bit deeper in what I think is the problem of uh, multiple religious belonging and or dual religious belonging and also what the promise is. So first I'll, I'll start with what the pro problem is. Um, in the first place, I think on a purely theoretical or theological level, even though scholars will say that all religions cohere in their ultimate reality, that is only possible if the concreteness of religious traditions is somewhat minimalized. So two religions never fully uh, and seamlessly overlap with one another. There are always somewhere conflicting claims to truth or conflicting practices if you take religion seriously in their own self-understanding. So, uh, if you pick and choose from different religions, then you can see how they cohere, but if you want to fully belong to two religions, you will always run into certain irreconcilable truth claims. And I mean, it's always obvious with religions that are very closely related, like Judaism and Christianity. Is Jesus the Messiah or is Jesus not the Messiah? Or Christianity and Islam, is Jesus the incarnation of God or is Jesus a prophet? And so on. So, you can see it clearly in religions that have come out of each other and that are in direct opposition to each other. 
but in a religion like Buddhism, or between Buddhism and Christianity, there are also irreconcilable differences between the two traditions. And you know, you can say, is there a personal creator God who continues to exist in a relationship with an eternal soul or self? That would be the Christian uh, perspective. Or is there no self? Is there no eternal self? And is the self just a continuously changing reality that ultimately dissipates or disappears once nirvana has been reached. So it's either one or the other. You have to believe in one or the other in order to fully adhere to Buddhism and to or to Christianity. Um, the same with the question of the uniqueness of Jesus. Is Jesus really the full and final revelation of God who through his death and resurrection has brought redemption and salvation for all of humanity. This is, of course, at the heart of Christian faith. But there is no place in Buddhist teaching or in Buddhist philosophy to affirm a once and for all unique salvific event in history. So this makes no sense from a Buddhist philosophical perspective. So just on a pure philosophical, theological, logical uh, perspective, the two religions really cannot be reconciled. And I think it's very clear in, in the elements that I have lifted up, you know, is there a self or is there no self? Is there a personal God or is there no God? Is Jesus the savior or is it impossible to think of one person in history saving the world once and for all? These are fundamental, irreconcilable theological uh, contradictions between the two traditions that, that from a logical perspective, I would say make it impossible to be both fully Christian and fully Buddhist at the same time. So that's on the theological level. On a practical level, um, the image that is often used in this area is like when you are chasing two rabbits, you may end up catching none. You know, so if you are pursuing the ultimate Buddhist aim and the ultimate Christian aim at the same time, uh, that would, be, would lead you to a sort of personal spiritual um, division or split in your own personality where you ultimately don't uh, attain either of those ultimate religious goals. That's at least if you believe that the, those goals are really different ultimately. So you can't pursue both of them at the same time unless you believe that they're completely the same. Um, my perspective on this is, is that every religious tradition ultimately expects a, a moment of complete surrender from, uh, from members, whether it's Christianity, Islam, Judaism, Hinduism, Buddhism. Each religious tradition has this uh, expectation that believers or members of their tradition will surrender completely to whatever is presented as the, the path and the goal of religious life. Um, and that complete surrender, you can say, you know, that the, the demand for exclusive belonging of religions is often seen as a, as a kind of jealous uh, possessiveness on the part of religion. But I see it more as a kind of spiritual requirement. Every religious tradition emphasizes the need to overcome your ego, to overcome yourself in order to attain the highest goal. And the requirement of complete surrender, I think, has to do with that expectation of surrender of self uh, and surrender of ego uh, on a particular spiritual path. And I think, you know, if we look at it in the perspective of how religions or the people in religions who pursue that highest goal in the most intense way, who would be maybe the monks, Buddhist monks, Christian monks, they have devoted themselves undividedly and entirely to a particular religious path um, and surrendered their whole will and, uh, and ego to a particular religious path, and that is what is necessary. And so uh, my fear is that the idea of or multiple belonging always creates a certain uh, restraint almost from a believer to fully go on a particular, in a particular path, to fully give oneself to a particular religious tradition. 
And with that restraint comes also, you know, the inability of letting go of the ego or the self. So that may be a little bit abstract, but I think it, it, it resonates with how the spiritual practices of, uh, of different religious traditions are, uh, are also organized. And then in the third place, I think one, a problem on an institutional level of religious hybridity is that religious hybridity creates a certain uh, degree of, uh, or a certain lack of involvement or investment or commitment to, um, to a community, to a set of practices that are all part of religious identity. So a colleague of mine has, has talked about multiple religious belonging in the context of the, sp the spiritual shift of, uh, of our times where religion is not about ritual, it's not about institutions, it's not about doctrines, it's about spirituality and spiritual experience and so on. And with that spiritual shift comes also you know, a devaluation of ritual practices and a devaluation of institutions and and a devaluation of community and everything that is part of religious traditions. So I think dual belongers still try to practice within more than one religious tradition, but in the end they cannot fully give themselves and fully invest themselves in, uh, in, in developing a particular religious tradition or in the continuity of a particular religious tradition when they are torn between two religious identities that they, that they feel are, uh, have to be addressed in their own person. So the idea of really committing oneself to you know, developing the theological self-understanding of a tradition or the, you know, the social uh, structure of a particular tradition or what have you, I think dual belongers tend to, just for practical reasons, not be able to invest that much in it. And because religion is so much, or, or belonging is understood just purely in a spiritual sense, they're maybe not quite as inclined to give themselves to the uh, continuity of, of a tradition and to, uh, to the social context of a particular religious tradition. So, so dual belonging in that sense, I think, is problematic on a theological level, on a practical level, and on, uh, on an institutional level. Um, however, I don't think that's the last word about, about dual belonging. So there, I have severe re reservations about dual belonging, mainly uh, about what I have introduced as hard dual belonging or full dual belonging, people who, for whom neither religion is dominant anymore, who have to decide for themselves where they go and, and which religion they, uh, they believe in on which topics. You know, so that's the kind of hard dual belonging. However, I think you know, dual belonging or multiple belonging and even spiritual but not religious as being in ours, uh, have something important to say to Christianity and to the church. Um, I think they represent an important critical mirror for the church, uh, both in terms of what is lacking, what is it that people need to find in other religions that they're not finding in Christianity. So on a critical level, it, they represent, I think, an important mirror for Christianity but also on a positive, on a more constructive level, sometimes I think we've come to the point where we're surprised that they still want to belong to Christianity and what is it that Christianity have to, has to offer that they still want to identify with and believe in and so forth. So both on a critical and on a constructive level, I think uh, dual belongers or multiple belongers or M SBNRs do have something uh, important to say to Christianity. On a critical level, I would say, you know, no religion is perfect. Every religion develops in the course of history in one or the other direction and maybe minimalizes or neglects certain aspects of its own potential or its own possibilities that other religions have developed more fully. So clearly this is the case with people who feel the need to pursue 
their own spiritual life and thirst by looking outside of Christianity. They are lacking something. There is mis something missing in Christianity that they are looking for uh, in other religious traditions. And I think this is an important moment of confrontation for, for Christianity. What is it that we are not offering that people are looking for? And clearly, I mean, some of the things that I have said that, uh, that are appealing for people in Buddhism, you know, sort of spiritual uh, therapies, uh, the emphasis on experience. So these traditions are really about de spiritual development and experiencing uh, the deepest self or the divine within oneself or however it's called. So that level of experience, I think, is very central to those traditions, and that's really what people are thirsting for, are looking for in these traditions. You know, they're looking for, for therapies that can make them experience uh, something divine, but they're also looking for direction sometimes. So the idea of, you know, spiritual techniques, but also spiritual direction, I think, is something that maybe we have neglected a little bit or a lot in the church, at least with regard to, you know, lay men and women. I mean, the, the, our whole spiritual tradition is so incredibly rich, but it's mostly developed behind the walls of monasteries and of which our you know, average lay people know very little. Uh, and so I think this confrontation with the need for the spiritual life that people are looking for outside can lead us to turn back and look at how we can provide for that within our own tradition. There's certainly plenty of riches, of spiritual riches in the Christian tradition that we can draw from. Uh, so what this can do is just reawaken or renew certain aspects of the Christian tradition that maybe we have neglected for too long and that people are really thirsting, uh, thirsting for. So, um, you know, the, so, what, what this uh, critical element can do is both help us recover elements from our own tradition that are there, but maybe also lead us to genuinely learn from the other religious traditions. Maybe Buddhism really has something to teach Christianity. Maybe Hinduism really has something to teach, or maybe Sufism or Judaism. Maybe these religions have developed certain things that have not been developed in Christianity in the course of his, its history, and that Christianity can really learn from and integrate without it being in contradiction with its self-understanding. So, so the kind of learning doesn't have to be one where one is going back and forth on two feet between religious traditions. One can be firmly planted within a religious tradition and learn plenty from other religious traditions. You know? So I think that's very clearly the case already in all kinds of Christian Zen, Christian yoga. Now there's Jesuit yoga also, I understand. Uh, so, what's that? It's not Christian. <laughs> okay. So there are all kinds of ways, I think, in which religions can learn from one another and learn from elements that have been more fully developed in other religious traditions. We don't just have to claim that, oh yeah, we already have it all and we'll just recover it. There's plenty of new things to learn, I think, from other religious traditions. And this is what we do, actually, just to put a plug for uh, our department. In the Department of Theology here at Boston College, we have an area of comparative theology where theologians, these are all PhD students who are doing exactly that kind of work of engaging other religious traditions in a constructive way to see what Christianity can learn from other religious traditions that can uh, broaden, deepen, and enhance its own uh, theological self-understanding. So this is, I think, a very exciting promise uh, for, uh, for the future. Uh, and then, um, secondly, as I said, you know, we, it also is a moment to think about why is it that Christians, that, that people who are dual belongers still want to belong to Christianity? Is it just out of nostalgia uh, for, for their own past? Because make no mistake, most dual belongers are Christians who have integrated elements from Buddhism. They're much less Buddhist who integrate elements from Christianity. Uh, so, but maybe, you know, maybe it's a nostalgia for their childhood or for their past, or is there something 
uh, that they don't, don't want to sacrifice by also learning from Buddhism? Is there something about Christianity that is distinctive and, and genuinely unique and that they don't want to give up in this kind of commitment to other religious traditions? And if you look at scholars who claim to belong to multiple religions like uh, Paul Nitter, his book, Without Buddha, I Would Not Be a Christian. Um, he argues here, for him, it's really the social teaching of the church and of Christianity that for him is unequaled in any other religious tradition and that he would not give up for anything, that he's firmly committed to no other religious tradition, he would argue, has developed a social uh, commitment or commitment to the poor and to the needy, to the hungry and so forth, as has Christianity. And that's something that, that he do, does not want to sacrifice in his interest uh, in Buddhism. So the social teaching f of the church, I think, is some, an area that is definitely um, uh, to be looked into and further developed and emphasized in, in our engagement with other religious traditions. Sometimes we have, as Christians, we, we're often very shy in, in dialogue with other religious traditions and we always talk about what we can learn from other religious traditions and so on. But I think the time has come now also in interreligious dialogue where we can also affirm what riches Christianity brings to other religious traditions that they may not have developed with as much sophistication as Christianity has in the course of its history. So I think that's definitely an element you know, again, it's a very personal matter why Christians uh, uh, who are engaged with Buddhism also want to remain Christian. For some, maybe it's the Christian teaching on forgiveness of sins uh, and mercy of God or the love of God. Um, you know, there may be any number of reasons. For some, it's a matter of community and solidarity that's so central to Christianity. There's plenty of reasons why Christians would want to remain Christian also in the tradition, but those are some of the elements that usually come up in, uh, in discussions on multiple, uh, multiple belonging. So by way of conclusion, uh, what I have tried to point out is that the reality of religious hybridity is, I think, an ambivalent reality. Uh, it's not something that can be so easily uh, brushed away. It's also not something that can be you know, uncritically affirmed. Uh, I think it's an ambivalent reality. On the one hand, it may detract from genuine and full identification with a particular religious tradition, and so as a result, it may stunt spiritual and religious development. On the other hand, you know, it may be a source of genuine enrichment and uh, renewal for religious traditions. I think, you know, we may sort of like I tended to do in the beginning when I dealt with this phenomenon of multiple belonging, sort of brush it away as a kind of self-interested um, uh, pursuit of, of individuals who refuse to surrender to any particular religious tradition. So we may sort of minimize its importance or we may uh, recognize the potential of this uh, reality for genuine religious development uh, and, and growth. And I think in particular, the people that I have referred to as soft multiple belongers, so Christian people who are genuinely committed to the church, but also uh, uh, sensitive to what other religious traditions have to offer. I think in these people, there's a huge promise and potential for uh, learning and, and for development within the church. So I look forward to our discussion. Thank you. I'm sure the discussions are really interesting. I wish I could listen in on all of them. <laughs> um, I have been asked to, uh, to field the questions and I've been asked also for you to wait until the microphone gets to you before asking the question so that uh, it can also be recorded. So, Tom. Catherine, thank you for a wonderful presentation. I'm amazed that people who can belong 
to more than one. I mean, I find it a full-time job just to belong, <laughs> even poorly, to belong poorly to one tradition. Um, and it's almost like talking about having two wives or two husbands, you know. I, I find one a lot of work. <laughs> it, 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 it's enough. I'd hate a second one. But my question is developmental. Um, when do we begin to introduce young people to the, to, to even by way of the enrichment, by way of ecumenism and their own outlook on life, when do we begin to introduce them to other traditions? I often think of, of John 14, you know, where Jesus says, in my father's house there are many mansions. So there are many homes within God's family. And yet he goes on and says, but I'm preparing a home for you. In other words, do we need a home within God's family first before, in other words, do we need to be grounded in the particular in order to reach out safely and well into the universal, or else do we just end up confused by the whole thing? Or if I could put it very concretely, a, a religion curriculum that I've created for high schools, I deliberately put the book on world religions, as it's often called, into the second semester of the senior year. I mean, hoping that in the previous three and a half years they might have been grounded in their own Catholic or Christian tradition, maybe then or maybe not even then, maybe that's too soon. In other words, if we start rambling away from our own tradition too soon, developmentally, are there hazards there that, that really would, we'd be ill-advised to encourage? I'm just wondering yeah. what you think of that. No, I, I'm sure you've thought about that much more than I have, but just on a logical uh, level, I think, uh, so the confrontation with religious diversity is always a shock for any religious believer because every religion presents itself as the ultimate, the highest, the best, and so forth. And then you're confronted with the fact, wait a minute, there are all these other religions that say the same for themselves, so how can, my, how can I stand by my conviction or but by what I have been taught that my religion is the only, the best, the highest, and so forth. So this is the challenge of relativism that is very real in the contemporary world and, and very difficult to navigate. Um, is it easier, in, fa in fact, first to know that there are different religions and then to choose and then to fully commit oneself? That's your question. I'm just repeating the question in a different way because I don't know what the final answer is. Or do you need, indeed, this foundation, but then is the risk that after the foundation is given or laid, that then the confrontation with other religions is so uh, disorienting that one loses that foundation. So I see you know, uh, possibilities and dangers in both. I don't think that there is a, an easy answer to, to the question of when the right time is. I think more urgent is to present one's own religion in, in a way that it it doesn't get so disoriented when the confrontation with other religions happens. So I think there's a lot of work, as you know better than I do, in terms of how we teach our children you know, uh, their faith or how we bring them up in a faith in a way that, that can integrate that confrontation with other religious traditions. I think that's where the more urgent work is to be done in the way Christianity is presented. Uh, so that would be my, uh, my response. To the idea of having more than one spouse, I won't address that one. <laughs> but uh, for most people who are dual belongers, they say their argument will be, well, nobody is fully, uh, necessarily fully identifies with one religious tradition. I mean, we all disagree with certain aspects of our own religious tradition also. So, the idea of complete and fully and undivided submission to one religious tradition is just unrealistic in the contemporary world where you know, there are all different layers or different levels of belonging and identifying with a tradition. And so since there is imperfect belonging, there should be multiple belonging. But so to my thinking, that doesn't make any sense uh, for the reasons that I have given before. Thank you, Catherine. Uh, as always, wonderful presentation. Um, um, I, I found one thing very interesting that you said about the uh, spiritual shift uh, in society, that, that people are not, no longer looking for ritual practices, but rather like, you know, and the rituals uh, that they need, but rather distance themselves, themselves from them. 
well, I wonder how, um, how that fits within their search for certain ritual practices in other religions. So usually they, um, you know, what we see is they, they have a desire to do yoga or to do a meditation. And so um, I wonder how these two phenomena um, relate to each other. I wonder if you can say more about that. So uh, the, it's, I think, uh, obvious that the kinds of rituals that they are looking for outside of Christianity are rituals that are very uh, meditative, contemplative, that are not sort of ritual performance uh, for, you know, with necessarily within a community or in accordance with the sacraments of a tradition or so. What people are looking for are the types of ritual, if you can call them rituals, that are sort of geared towards inner experience. So whether it's the bodily ritual of yoga or the meditation that comes with Buddhism, that's really what people are looking for rather than sort of the performance of rituals according to a particular you know, rhythm or schedule that is you know, given by a tradition and that one has to observe because one belongs to the tradition. People want to be free to do yoga when they want to do yoga, to meditate when they want to meditate, and just to do it in terms of their own spiritual fulfillment. And if it doesn't give the f spiritual fulfillment or if it doesn't have any effect, so, you know, Part of this is also that religion has become very sort of functional. It has to work or it has to have an effect or it's not true. So we, we've come to, I think, that uh, tendency also in, in religious identity. So the rituals that are pursued are sort of contempl contemplative rituals. And so that's sort of part of that spiritual shift that, that I talked about also. Catherine, I'd like to second his motion first that your presentation was not only marvelously comprehensive, it covered the spectrum, but it was also very succinct. And now I'd like to get your reaction if I could piggyback on Tom's question. And that's this. From my own experience, there may be an answer from your talk for the very fine question that Tom put to you, and that's this. As a boy growing up in Brooklyn, New York, in the Catskill Mountains, I had a lot of non-Christian friends, especially Jewish. And I very quickly learned that if a, if a guy was going to become bar mitzvah or a gal was going to become bat mitzvah, they would invite me to synagogue. But when I was to be confirmed, many of them let me know that I shouldn't invite because they would feel uncomfortable in a Catholic church. That's a learning process for a very young man about how different religions perceive one another and what's possible. It strikes me, therefore, in answer to Tom's question, that we might say, in this environment, not everyone grows up in a big city, but everyone does grow up in a more or less cosmopolitan environment. And it may be the case, long before they've had the benefit of Tom's curriculum, they've already been exposed to all these other faiths. And the penchant for going toward soft rather than hard is already there, and it's growing. So it might be the case that we could ask, as instructors, each of our students the following question. Have you engaged people from other faiths? Have they engaged you? If they have, whether you're 12 or 15 or 20, what did you learn from them already? And what were you able to share with them? And the latter question will compel our students to say, what do I really hold and what do I really understand? What have I experienced? What have I appropriated to myself from my own faith? So just by the process of dialogue, they do grow in their own faith, mm -hmm. even as they engage their friends, which is the best way to engage. What would you think of that? I think it's a wonderful uh, proposal. I think there's very few occasions where you become more uh, compelled to know your tradition than when you're in relation with somebody else. And so then you suddenly want to learn more about your own tradition because you, you realize how little you know. And religions are indeed so infinitely rich and we can never know everything, but it really would pressure you indeed or encourage you to uh, learn more about your own tradition and see what you can share. So I think it's a wonderful suggestion. Thank you. Merci bien. <laughs> Rachel? 
Thanks, Catherine. I also really appreciated how how organized you were in what you presented, because I feel like sometimes people can be rambling and not quite clear, and I felt like I could easily make an outline of what you were saying. Um, the thing that kept coming up for me and what came up in our little mini discussion was the, the way in which when we look at like developmental models of faith, so looking at like James Fowler's developmental models, a lot of what you described in these desires for individualistic things and a desire for leaving a tradition is really that transition from stage three to stage four, where you go from seeing something external, for those of you who are not familiar with this, something external as a hierarchical structure being what defines your faith and what defines your religious belonging to something that's more internally focused. And I just wondered how, if you'd like thought about that in this way and within the within the conversation of religious hybridity and then also like how we might look at this is actually a, a, a phenomena that is a result of more people getting to stage four in their faith tradition over time and what that can tell us about what we as a church need to be doing to ensure that people can get to the next stage <laughs> eventually and or if potentially that this interreligious part of things, sorry as I'm like constructing a question as I speak, but if religious hybridity is actually the pathway forward. Mm -hmm. So yeah. what would be beyond stage four? To someone who knows more about, Tom. Great. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, stage, uh, this is uh, Kohlberg or <coughs> Fowler and so on, developmental stages. Stage three is kind of a conventional faith where you just believe it all because your mom and dad were Jewish or Catholic or Christian or something. Stage four is when you begin to make up your own mind about which, where to belong. And, but the belonging of, of, of stage four is usually, at least the developmentalists say, uh, pretty uh, extreme. Either they believe it all or reject it all. Young people who are very conservative in their faith and young people who have walked away. They, what did you call them? The, the spiritual but not religious are the nuns, so that it's either or at stage four. Whereas stage five, you begin to see, uh, embrace paradox and ambiguity, and you begin to see the shortcomings of your own faith, and yet you're still willing for a greater good. Perhaps you find more there than to attract you, than to di to, that distracts you or drives you away. And so you continue to belong because of, because of the Eucharist or something, mm -hmm. even though you have all kinds of complaints about the church. Um, at that's stage five. Then T Fowler talks about stage six, as which I really don't want to reach because it's, it's when you, it's like Gandhi and you know uh, <laughs> Dorothy Day and and Mother Teresa and people like that. So I, I'll be happy at stage five. Uh, a lot of lot of stage six people get shot, they get exe <laughs> get exe get executed, for example. But it is when you can embrace a universal faith. At least that's how the developmental, or when you can be deeply grounded in your own particular tradition, and yet be enriched by exposure to and access to other traditions, but yet you know where your home is. You, you have a particular grounding. And, and without that, I think you can get lost. You, you can ramble away from home, but not know your way home, yeah. in, unless you have the grounding in that particular origin. So that'd be stage six. Yeah. In that case, then I guess I was talking more about like stage five as being the space in which perhaps religious hybridity is a necessary component is it necessary yeah yeah I think you know in fact in the world today it's very difficult to be ignorant of other religious tradition and if you are a genuine spiritual seeker uh, you will recognize the beauty in other religious traditions also and if you become a mature believer you will be able to integrate the beauty of other religious traditions without compromising your, your primary religious identity. So I think there's probably a continuum from stage four where you integrate it in a mature way to stage six when you are sort of transcendent almost. Um, so uh, it, it also sounds a little bit like this continuum goes from you know, a religious identity to, to almost a sort of sense of pluralism of all religious traditions, which is also not where I want to go with, with this discussion. I think it's the ambiguity or the, the paradox of SBNR and, and hybrid belonging is that the people who are multiple belongers or nuns rely on the religions that they reject 
in the end. So that's the internal ambiguity or the paradox. They don't want to really follow a particular religion in its full self-understanding, but they depend on it to formulate their own kind of synthesis of different religious traditions. And so the problem for me is really the continuity of these rich traditions. These rich traditions will only continue if we have people who do dedicate themselves to continuing its sophisticated theological tradition and adjusting its, its spiritual practices and so on so as to make it appealing. But you have to have people who really want to contribute to one particular tradition, I think, in order for that to happen. And, and in order for the nuns, there will always be nuns, but they, then they can profit from any number of religious traditions. But if there are no more traditions, which in the, in the most radical sense of SBNRs and nuns and hard do belongers, that's really the end of religion as we know it. And then what do we have to replace that kind of uh, richness that, that we have developed in the course of history? So that's my main concern. I mean, it's maybe a little hypothetical, but we have to, I think, already anticipate what might happen. Dave? Thank you. That was um, not a clarification, and the questions have been clarifying for me as well. But I guess my worry um, about your critique is that uh, I think a lot of us have gone soft, right? We're soft. We don't even have to be a hybrid to be soft. We once upon a time may have made a kind of spousal contribution of ourselves to the tradition and have come to have reservations about the extent of that, learned in part from our students and in my own case, from my children and grandchildren. Um, and I, I wonder about that. I wonder about the implication of what you said for solidarity. That is, it's not just the spiritual, not religious, the spiritual ideal that lies beyond them all, but it has to do, I think, a little bit at least, with the unity of the human family. Huh? That how, what are the implications of your critique for our desire to be at one with everybody. And that may have seemed like a kind of crazy dream once, the sixes that only get for a few people, but is that unity of the human family not increasingly, not just a spiritual ideal, but maybe even a moral imperative that's right in front of us? Thank you, and David. It's a very rich question that I think I would have to develop in, in great detail, but I think when I emphasize sort of the singular belonging it's never at the exclusion of, of truth and beauty in other religious traditions and the idea that we do all share a common spiritual desire and thirst and uh, desire for peace and harmony in the world. So, so I think we have to first of all recognize that all religious traditions have that sort of common thirst for peace and unity and harmony and we can recognize that in each other. Secondly, I think for that to be possible though, religions have to develop a certain degree of humility. Theological humility, institutional humility, uh, ethical humility in terms of how far they have gone in terms of achieving their own religious goals. And I think that humility itself is already almost a sufficient condition to be open and generous and loving towards people from other religious traditions who are also searching for the good and the holy. You know, so if we recognize that our institutions are fallible, our doctrines are not complete, our rituals are maybe uh, limited, uh, all of that recognition, I think, opens us up to recognizing other religious traditions so I think we can belong to one religious tradition and, and have the humility to recognize the importance and the beauty of other religious traditions. It's not either I belong to one religion, all the others are false, they all have to be converted to my religion. I think you can belong to one tradition and be open to the others, as I have said, and, and create a sense of, of solidarity. I mean, there's nothing that leads to better interreligious dialogue than working together in solidarity for the poor, for the hungry, for liberation in various forms. So that is, I think, 
the best gateway into interreligious harmony and understanding. Um, and, I, and, and that's, I think you can fully belong to one religious tradition and also have that kind of openness towards uh, or focus on the humanity of others and the brotherhood and sisterhood of all, the world, of all believers. Yeah. I have a quick thought and then a question. Um, in the 1960s in Charlestown Parish, I went to CCD class, and uh, Father Smith, the parish priest, introduced world religions when I was a freshman. It was utterly fascinating. So maybe that's the time to introduce it. We, we enjoyed it. My question, as I talk with my friends in various cities, Boston, suburbs, different states, the phenomena, I'm sorry, the, the phenomena that seems to come up is that a number, a significant number of our kids who have been steeped in the Catholic tradition and education simply have rejected the church. And it is quite a phenomena. I'm not saying it's, it's accurate, but I've noticed for several years this keeps coming up. So it isn't, a, and if there's a church or a spiritual tradition they lean towards, it is Buddhism. But you, we're talking about blended religions, if you will, or do belongers. But I think, at least as I said in my experience, there's a pretty wholesale rejection of Catholicism and a lot of what comes with it. And that's certainly a concern. Do you have any thoughts? Thank you. <laughs> if I had an answer to that. <laughs> um, I see it, of course, in, in our students. I mean, we see it in our students. It, it really went from, I think, um, you know, sort of openness in my courses to other religious traditions to now almost a complete indifference. You know, in, in 10 years ago when I would ask my students, how many of you believe that all religions are equally true? 80%. Now, when I ask them, they haven't even thought about it. <laughs> they haven't even considered the question. So that I find really, exciting, <laughs> in the sense that they know so little. Uh, I mean, many have rejected it, and many have rejected it for very good reasons, and I respect it, you know. But, but it's what they have rejected. I, what I find so sad is that what they have rejected is just such a minute and almost insignificant part of what, what the tradition of the church is and what it has to offer. And it's the fault of the church, of course. You know, I don't blame uh, blame them. You know, but but if they knew a little bit more about the richness of the tradition, and if it was introduced to them in a way that made sense, you know, now I can teach my students, and they all start from scratch, and I can wake them up, and they really are excited and interested in in what I have to teach them, and so. I mean, the questions don't go away. I think we are going through a very difficult period in the church where, you know, as I said, people have rejected it for very good reasons. But the, the religious thirst, the spiritual thirst of people will always be there and always be there to be nourished in a way. And, I, and you know, I'm, for one, excited about the possibility of nourishing that in the right way. So thank you very much. <laughs>